I am pleased to join with you today in a commemoration of those times now so long ago, but in my mind, just as fresh a recollection as if it happened yesterday. I think this school should be located not in a city, but in a town. in which the school will overshadow every other interest in the community. It was a great moment for our community when the commission charged with selecting the site of the new state normal school in Western Kentucky rendered its judgment that the school would be located in Murray. On the campus of Murray State University, a single figure looms large, Dr. Rainey T. Wells. I'm Kevin Qualls, and I invite you to join me in a discovery of this man, the founder, the president, the legendary Rainy T. Wells. Pogue Library is one of the oldest and most beautiful buildings on the MSU campus. It is a repository of many historical photographs and documents, many of them relating to Dr. Wells. But those documents don't tell the whole story. To understand Dr. Wells and his accomplishments, I must first appreciate the times in which he lived. What was life like in Callaway County in the first part of the last century? To find out, I went to Pogue Library and visited with university archivist Dieter Ulrich. Oh, of course, we've got many books. Of course, we have his manuscript collection. We have the um, President's Papers, which go back to the 1920s. Um, they're the Board of Regents records. Um, basically, anything that the university published, student newspapers, college catalog, it's across the board. Anything that the university had published, printed, or even just files that they had have all kept here in the, in the archives. And they go back to day one, when the university first began. Well, what we have here is a, a microfilm scrapbook from that time period that was done by, I think, by, I believe, by one of his relatives. So, this would be a good start. The Civil War had ended only 10 years prior to the 1875 Christmas Day birth of Rainey T. Wells. Although the war had ended, its aftermath continued throughout the years of Wells' childhood. Disparate loyalties during the war continued as mistrust among the people of Callaway County. They were largely tobacco farmers, descended from Virginia and North Carolina tobacco farmers. They had exhausted their lands, then migrated to Callaway County. The soil here produced a particularly prized crop that came to be known as dark patch tobacco. In the late 1890s, Rainey Wells returned to Callaway County after finishing his education at Southern Normal University. He returned to a community that was sharply divided. Lingering post-war mistrust and competition over tobacco pricing brought about the darkest hours of Callaway County. It was the time of the Knight Riders. Union or Confederate, Republican or Democrat, city or county, the historical factions within the county again formed in bitter dispute. The Planters Protection Association consisted of nearly 20,000 dark-fired tobacco growers throughout western Kentucky and Tennessee. Their political sentiments were aligned with the Confederacy and the Democratic Party. They contended that the American Tobacco Company, the major distributor of dark patch tobacco, constituted a monopoly in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. The American Tobacco Company was deemed to represent Union and Republican interests. They were accused of price fixing, 
that lowered the price of Callaway County's prized dark patch tobacco. Association farmers banded together to set their own prices. Non-association farmers sold their crops at market themselves, usually to the American Tobacco Company. Those farmers that did this and refused to join the Planters Protection Association were subject to fierce intimidation by hooded night riders. In Callaway County, this intimidation was amplified by the editor of the Murray Ledger. Jennings served as secretary of the association. His editorials insisted that the Knight Riders were not representative of the association as a whole. All the while, he encouraged Callaway County growers to pledge allegiance to the association by having their names printed in his newspaper. The Knight Rider violence was finally put down when Callaway County Judge A.J.G. Wells summoned 50 Kentucky State Troopers to Callaway County. It was a scene reminiscent of Civil War occupation. By 1920, the Planters Protection Association had largely died away. Still, Callaway County seemed an unlikely place to locate a college. The county was remote. The expression, you can't get there from here, could have easily been coined in Callaway County. The county had 623 miles of road. The better ones were gravel. Rail travel offered two destinations, north to Paducah or south to Fulton. The not yet bridged Tennessee River bound Callaway County on the east. This was the world in which Rennie T. Wells lived when the state indicated that a teacher's college would be built in the western part of the state, competition began among several cities and towns, including Paducah, Mayfield, Hopkinsville, and Fulton. At that time, all of them were more accessible and more prosperous than Murray. Yet, somehow, Dr. Wells brought the normal school to Murray. In order to establish a college in Murray, Dr. Wells had to be successful on two fronts. He had to use his knowledge and position as a member of the Kentucky legislature, and he had to raise a lot of money. Dr. Bob Jackson has done both of these things. I visited MSU's Heritage Hall to meet with him and find out how Dr. Wells managed to found a college in Murray. In, in 1920, which you have to really back up a couple years prior to three years prior to our founding, 1920, the legislature uh, established an education commission. And their job at that time was to, they were going to look at all the public schools across the Commonwealth and, and evaluate our, our common schools, our public schools across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. They, they, they said many things, and, but one of the things that really stood out is we need more and better teachers in, in the Commonwealth. So this was the impetus to, uh, for 1922's legislative session, which established Senate Bill 14 to create two additional normal schools, one in the far eastern part of the state and one in the far western part of the state. So uh, Dr. Rennie T. Wells being, being the, the wise statesman that he was, this really opened the door for him. Uh, and the, I'm sure the light went off in, in his head to say, this is the normal school I've been working toward for many years. And I'm going to work the best I can, as hard as I can to locate it in Murray. Where you going, boys? We're going fishing, Dr. Wells. <laughs> well, catch a mess for me. <laughs> you think they'll catch anything? No, that pond gets fished out every other day. <laughs> Bob, I cannot thank you enough for meeting me at the depot. Well, you know I'd extend this courtesy to you under, uh, under any circumstance. 
But as you may suspect, I'm kind of wondering what went on at the meeting. Of course, I haven't finished preparing my remarks, but it surely is good to be home at Edgewood. Well, yeah, I understand. I know it's a, it's a long train trip from Louisville to Paducah and Paducah to here, but uh, you've certainly considered your remarks. Now, it wouldn't hurt to share that with an old friend like me now, would it? <laughs> they all made pledges if they could raise the $100,000 necessary to build the first building. Spoke about their communities, the size, the fact that they were accessible by rail and road. They all gave assurances of what they could do if they were selected as the site of the new normal school. So, uh, what did you do? I managed to speak last. The other communities had told the committee what they would do if they were selected as the home of the normal school. Decided to show them what had already been done. The high school, ready to accommodate the classes until the normal school should be built. The, the citizens, opening their houses to receive the students in their homes. Well, yeah, I understand, but now, what about the money? Well, I decided at that point to give a demonstration. Other people had said they could raise the money. But I showed them a ledger with over 1,300 names who contributed sums great and small. And then I presented them two checks totaling $100,000 and a deed of land worth $17,000. Not what we would do, what we had done. Proof in hand. What was the committee's reaction to that? Robert? I expect classes to begin in September. <laughs> Many thanks again, old friend. Many thanks again. <laughs> to get a sense of the personality of Dr. Wells, I met with someone who has been researching him much longer than I have. Sid Easley is a prominent Murray attorney who served on the Murray State University Board of Regents for 12 years, 10 of them as chairman. His family had an early connection with Dr. Wells, and he has enjoyed a decades-long friendship with fellow board member Wells Lovett, grandson of Rainy T. Wells. Their conversations often included the legendary stories of MSU's founder. Rainey Welch was a person who comes along once, maybe in one or two generations. He was a very unique and a very powerful person. You don't see them that much. And Rainey Welch, from what I've read about him and what I've seen about him, it wouldn't matter if he were living in 2013 or if he were living in 1913, he was going to succeed. He was a driven person, he was a bright person, he was a gifted person. He was a scholar. Uh, and and he, was, he was destined to succeed wherever he was and wherever he might land. He left the Murray Institute and he went to a, to a school that was called Southern Normal. It was in Huntington, Tennessee. I think the school was open 20 or 30 years. He actually went to school there for about four years. And it was there that he got his law degree. They taught law and they taught medicine at that particular school. He got his law degree and came back to Murray about 19, 19 and one and began the practice of law. He was a good lawyer. And I know that from what Wells has told me, frankly. He tried a lot of murder cases and uh, in those days, lawyers were jack of all trades. He ran for the legislature pretty soon after coming back, which was not uncommon for young lawyers because it would get their names out. Well, the records that I have is that he was very, very, a very good legislator. He was, a, he was an orator of unusual ability. While he was in the legislature, he, 
The people who have written about him say that he was an unusually strong and gifted legislator. Uh, and I could see that simply because he had the ability, he had the ability to, to lead people. And while he was there, he made some valuable contacts. And some of those contacts came because of his character. Once he would commit himself to vote a certain way, Wells has told me that, he would never change. And one of those votes, when he refused to change after he had committed, was for someone who was able to help him get appointed to the State Tax Commission. It was a very powerful body in Kentucky at that time. He was an orator of unusual ability. And I think you see it in his law practice later on. Because once he goes to Omaha, Nebraska, to an extent you can say, well, he was a country lawyer before that, but suddenly he begins playing with the big boys. And he tries a lot of cases representing Woodman of the World Life Insurance Company. He has cases that go to the Supreme Courts, the highest courts in Missouri and Nebraska several times. And then in 1937, he had a case that went to the United States Supreme Court. He argued a case before some of the, those great Supreme Court justices in 1938, uh, Hugo Black, uh, Frankfurter, uh, Brandeis. It's, it's really hard to believe that he argued cases before those giants. I am sure that when he was up there at Alvin Barkley, may well have been majority leader of the Senate, and he and Barkley were big friends because Barkley was from here. So I'm sure he saw Barkley when he was there. So, and there are few lawyers that ever have the opportunity to argue before the Supreme Court of the United States. Rainey Wells did that. So he was no real country bumpkin. He was very, very capable and a scholar and a legal scholar. During my time with Sid Easley, I heard many interesting stories about Rainey Wells. I learned that he was a man of faith. I learned that he held weekly chapel services for the students and faculty of the school. Imagine a chapel assembly led by Dr. Rainey Wells. His typewritten manuscripts indicate a timeless message, motivational to contemporary students. Now I know you young people, sometime in your early lives, in some precious silent moment, you said to yourself, I am going to live a purposeful life. And that's why you're here. And you get along very well until you meet somebody who wants you to do something else. And you turn back. You think to yourself, well, it won't make much difference. I will go on the road just as soon as I do this thing. I will go back on the highway of life just as soon as I finish this little detour. But Christ says that the man who lays his hand to the plow and turns back is not fit to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not preaching. But I would be perfectly happy this afternoon if every young lady and every young gentleman in this auditorium would resolve to undertake to do as the scripture advises us to do. Starting out to go somewhere and not turning back for any reason, but to drive directly to the goal. Now you are going to have persuasions, you are going to have influences, you are going to have impediments, threats, all along the way, but when you overcome them the first time, you will find that it is easier to overcome them. You will be stronger in defeating these obstacles. They will not impede you. If you do not build your character, staying determined to your purpose, while you're at college, or continue to build the good character with, you, with which you came to us. Your time in college 
is lost and is worthless. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Well, I'm not going to preach to you this afternoon. I'm not going to discuss immortality, but I have another sense of these words that has always impressed me. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? My judgment is that a person can lose his soul in a way other than in immortality. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? I have no objection to a person accumulating vast wealth. The fact is, I think it is commendable that a person give particular attention to the material things of life provided he has the right spirit to use his earnings and his accumulations for the benefit of mankind. I have no objection to an individual being paid a salary of $50,000 a year. Do you? Nay, $150,000 a year. Is that better? Or even a million dollars. But I have known some men who were paid a million dollars a year and were too busy to collect it. I have known some men who were paid a million dollars for their service and were too busy to earn it. I am talking about something that I have in my heart, that a person should not lose all of his or her life by being too busy with the material things in life. We can do it another way. Not only by giving to individuals, but by having a cause that is worthy. A person that spends all his time forgetting that he could give something to somebody else and saving the real life within him is not much benefit to the world. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his real purpose of life in accumulating anything of lasting benefit, either for himself or for somebody else? I think I once said that I could see why so many people are so busy about immortality, and that is because they haven't any hereafter to be proud of or look forward to. Young men and young women, Great men and great women should give some attention while they are here to the accumulation of happiness and the enjoyment for themselves and especially for others. I'm not expecting you this afternoon to accept for full value what I'm trying to say to you in this crude way. But I would be satisfied just to have the realization in years to come that there are more individuals in this life who benefited by what they did not have of the world as much as what they gave to the world. I think the task of the instructor is the greatest task that can be conferred upon an individual because you have more power, you have more influence. You can bring more disappointment, you can bring more happiness than any other person who comes in contact with the human mind. No individual in life has such power and influence, such an opportunity to reach the tender stages of humanity. And you young people, when you leave this campus, will not have such an opportunity of assembling with such a body of students anymore. And I say to you, during your four years of college is a time to enlarge your souls. And the way to enlarge your lives is to so broadcast your life into the lives of others, and it will return to you a hundredfold. Rainey Wells did enlarge his life. He did broadcast it into the lives of others. He united his community with a common value that transcends political sentiment and historical differences.
Among the self-reliant people of Callaway County, Rainey Wells championed the cause of education. With their support, Dr. Wells secured the normal school to be established in Murray. He recruited a well-respected educator, Dr. John Carr, to be the school's first president. From 1926 to 1932, Dr. Wells served as the school's second president. During this time, Lovett Auditorium, Carr Health Building, and Polk Library were all completed. The home he built, then called Edgewood and now called Oakhurst, serves as the home of Murray State Presidents. His legacy continues in the lives and careers of those educated at Murray State University and for those who work in this place he built.